Thank you, Mr. Reinhardt. Uh, Dr. Murphy. Well, thank you uh, for having me and thank you for having this uh, hearing. I think it's very important that the, the public realizes the possible role the Federal Reserve has been playing in high oil prices. Unfortunately, a lot of my prepared remarks are going to overlap with what Mr. Reinhardt said, so I, I wish I had gone first and then he'd be copying me. Um, but I'll go ahead and, and maybe I'll say uh, his same points in somewhat different language. The, so, so, of course, what everyone knows is that the Federal Reserve has expanded its balance sheet since the crisis set in by about $1.6 trillion in terms of the, what's called the monetary base. So that's how much physical currency is in circulation plus banks checking account uh, deposits with the Fed, as it were. So to, to put that number in perspective, from the time the Fed was founded in late 1913 up until the fall of 2008, they hadn't put that much in. So the Fed has added more in the last two and a half years than the entire history of the Fed up until that point. And that number is, was $1.6 trillion, you said? Right, about yep. $1.6 trillion, Got and it. yeah, has, how much they've added since September of 2008 to the monetary base. And the, up until that point was $932 billion right. from 1913 to then. So, so when we say that there's unprecedented interventions, I mean, that's not hyperbole, it really is. And of course, we know same time period, the price of oil has, depending on when you start and, and stop it, has almost tripled. So the question is, do the two have anything to do with each other is, is the coincidence. So in my written testimony, I gave the two main mechanisms by which Fed policy could be driving the increase in oil prices. So the first one is what the Joint Economic Committee focused on in their recent report. And what they looked at was just the fall in the dollar against other currencies, because as Mr. Reinhardt said, oil is an international fungible commodity, so oil prices basically have to be the same for everybody once you adjust for currency uh, exchange rates. And so if the dollar is falling against other currencies, that means the oil price quoted in U.S. dollars is going to go up, everything else equal. So in other words, Americans have seen oil prices go up more than the Japanese, for example. Right. All right, so that was... So if you look, at, they looked at, uh, the JEC report looked at from, I guess, when QE1 was announced in November of 08 up until whenever this report came out, and they said the dollar fell about 14 percent, looking at the index they used. And so on those calculations, that's how they're coming up with the figure that if the dollar had stayed as strong as it was when QE1 was announced up until today, then right now gas prices at the pump would be about 57 cents lower. Okay, so that's, that's the logic they're using to come up with that estimate is they're saying the dollar has fallen since the announcement of QE1 and then QE2, and hence if, if the dollar stayed the same, then gas would be 57 cents cheaper at the pump right now. That's, that's what their argument is. Uh, there's a, but there's a whole other possible mechanism that they didn't address, and that is, is it possible that the, the broad rise in commodities in general, regardless of the currency that you're using, could that also be right. influenced by Fed policy? And I would argue that it is, but it, it's hard to come up with with a quantitative amount. Um, just for, for qualitative uh, arguments, commodities in general have gone up. So it's not just that oil went up. It's commodities across the board. And even, like for example, gold and silver, since the crisis in fall of 08 till now, gold's gone up about 80 percent and silver something like 210 percent. Right? So I don't think that, I think it's very plausible to say at least some of that is due to people are afraid of the dollar being debased, and so they're rushing into the precious metals you know, as, as an inflation hedge. It's not just that people in China are given more jewelry as presents, and that's why gold and silver are up so much. Right? So if you, if you buy the logic there when it comes to gold and silver, it's not a stretch to say, well, maybe some investors, you know, there's lots of liquidity floating around. What are they going to do with their money? They're not going to put it in real estate, obviously. Maybe they don't want to put it in the stock market because the economy's bad. Maybe they're going to go into commodities thinking, you know, this is surely wheat and oil are always going to have, you know, a demand, and so I'm going to, that's a way to protect my wealth in case there's future inflation. So that's the other possible mechanism by which Fed policy could be worked. So, you know, given whatever the world price of oil is, that the dollar falls, that's one thing. But the other mechanism is maybe commodities, part of that huge upswing is people are trying to hedge themselves uh, against inflation. So those, so those would be the two. Uh, and if I can inter interrupt just for a second, and would you say, so that's not, that's just maybe just good, smart, practical investing versus any type of speculator driving the price up? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it depends what your perspective is. To me, that's like saying, you know, is it, it's cold out because the thermometer is, is showing a low reading. I mean, mm -hmm. if, 
if people think that something bad is going to happen, then they react, and that's that's the whole point of, or one of the points of having futures markets in the first place, right. is okay. to anticipate future movements. We'll give you a few, thirty more seconds if you want, since I took some of your time. Uh, that that's fine. Okay, I'll thanks, stop. Doctor. Doctor Baker. <laughs>